Hello everyone, good afternoon, uh, good evening, good morning, whatever time of day it is that you're listening and whether that be now or in our recording, thank you for coming. My name's Vanessa Crouch, otherwise known as Ness Crouch. I am here to share with you some of my experiences of producing digital text for the Australian curriculum. Now, I may say the Australian curriculum, but that doesn't mean if you're coming from a different part of the world that you can't take these tools and use them. So to begin with, I'm going to contextualise a little bit around what the Australian curriculum looks like because it has changed in recent years. And then I'm going to share with you some examples of what I do in my classroom or have done in my classroom to help my students to be able to produce digital text to meet the expectations of the Australian curriculum. Um, so first of all, I'd like to thank our sponsors and supporters, to Adult Learning Australia and Broadband for Seniors, to wonderful groups of people who provide education, for, education services for people who are no longer in school. Uh, and Broadband for Seniors in particular um, do a great job in their community centres. The Australia E-Series who pro, uh, have organised and brought you the the sessions over the conference weekend, so it's great to be a part of that team. And also a big, 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 huge thank you to the Learning Revolution Project and Steve Hargaden and Blackboard Collaborate. Without Steve's support, we wouldn't be able to bring these sessions to you, so thank you very much. All right, so if you would like to grab a little smiley face or an earthen Put it where you are on the map. I am in Queensland in a place called Toowoomba, which is about two hours, or an hour and a half west of Brisbane. Um, I work in Toowoomba, so it's it's a, it's a, it's actually quite a large city, the biggest, the second biggest inland city in Australia, and it is one of the regional centres of this area. So lots of crops and things around where we are. Great, so um, welcome to those people. So we've got a couple in the US, I know, and we've got shambles in Thailand and a few in Australia. Lovely to have you here. Thank you for coming. Okay, so um, I guess where I'm starting is um, with the Australian curriculum. So the Australian curriculum has an aspect of it which is general capabilities, so you've got numeracy, literacy, critical and creative thinking, etc. ICT or information communication technologies are part of those general capabilities. So what that means is that as well as having to, to achieve the expectations of the specific curriculum areas, there is an expectation that these general capabilities will uh, appear and be taught across those subject areas. Uh, in particular, this is evident in the English curriculum. However, it's also evident in lots of other curriculum areas. Uh, in New South Wales, because it's gone its own slight little direction of its own, um, it's found in the uh, writing and representing aspect. Uh, now, I do just want to share with you a quick tour of what that can look like in the Australian curriculum. So I'm just sharing my screen with you here uh, and I'll do this a little bit throughout the, the sessions. So if we think about, um, this is for example the year one science curriculum uh, and you'll notice that we've got on the right hand side, third inqui science inquiry skill down, an expectation that in year one students use informal measurements to collect and record observations using digital technologies as appropriate. Uh, that some may say, oh that's a bit tricky for year one, but it's an expectation. These expectations begin in year, oh, sorry, foundation year or prep, depending on where you are. Uh, this is the digital Digital Technologies Curriculum, which is a uh, relatively new curriculum. Uh, I'm looking here at the Year 3-4 th 
expectations. If you have a look here, the knowledge and understandings and the skills, these expectations for year three, four may sound a little bit scary. Luckily, if we click on the um, the item, so I'll look at this one here, uh, it will it will give you some extra information about how you might be able to do that. These elaborations are very useful in helping to understand the curriculum. So there's an expectation that by year three and four, students are able to use inform investigate how information systems can be used across communities to meet needs. Uh, and that can be quite challenging because if you're not a teacher that has a lot of skills in information systems or digital technologies, you may find achieving these expectations quite challenging. Uh, and here I've got the Year 6 English curriculum. It's here where we start to see a lot more um, connections with digital technologies, so you've got the need to um, use, including media, you have to use media texts. There is an expectation that children will be using different types of um, tools to be able to produce their texts. I'll just move down so you can see them. There's quite a lot here. Um, and often it will mention using multimedia text or imagery or um, digital tools is the other term that you often see. Here's the creating text down here, so we'll see some of that here. Um, and I know that, um, for example, you've got word processing expectations there as well and creating text. I know that in my schools where I have worked, uh, these expectations when the curriculum was introduced were quite scary, uh, especially with those teachers who have not had a lot of experience using digital tools. And if anyone has not yet watched the recording of Kathy Beck's presentation, which has been on just before mine, I recommend you, you watch it because you will find yourself a million and one tools that you can use. It was absolutely brilliant. Okay, so what tools do you use? I've got some examples here. Uh, Kathy can put in about, I don't know, an endless list, but I've selected some of the ones that I use fairly regularly. Um, so if you'd like to type in the chat some of the tools that you use in your in your situations, whether that's classroom or um, adult education situations or teacher education situations, that you use to get your participants, your learners, to be able to produce some sort of text out of what they're doing. Great, some great ones there. Yes, Google Docs is a fave of mine too, Shambles. And Prezi, yes, I love Prezi. Prezi's great fun. Um, Kathy's probably got a long list coming to us. <laughs> and I know Anne's very experienced in this area as well, so there's lots of ideas out there. So I'd just like to briefly talk about um, the tools that I have listed here uh, and, and how I use them. And then I want to show you a few examples. So we'll start with my little friend, Storybird. I really love Storybird. I am no artist. I have no ability to draw at all. So when I found Storybird, which has some beautiful pictures that I can use in storytelling to, to tell a story of some description, whether that be a poem or, or a, a fictional tale or whatever, I was really excited because my texts could be great, but my, my drawings could be even better. When I have used this in my classroom, the children really enjoy um, one of the tasks I've given them with Storybird is actually creative writing. So they didn't have anything to write to start with. They had to look through some of the options of pictures they could choose and then they decided um, which pictures they would select and then tell the story from that. So it was a really interesting way of getting them to think a little bit creatively. 
Uh, Storybridge, you can um, set up student accounts as well, so you can manage them quite effectively. Easily is a way of I have used with my students can, can um, in different ways. We basically it's a tool where you can share visual ideas online. So it's similar. Um, it's it's a tool where you can basically put some pictures up and create text around it, similar to an infographic, I guess, is what I'm trying to say there. Wikispaces is brilliant for children to be able to create content. Oh, okay, thanks for that, Kathy. I hadn't heard of Little Bird Tales. Keep that one in mind. Um, Wikispaces is a great place for you to, and there's lots of wiki type. Uh, options out there. I just happen to choose Wikispaces. Um, it's a way of children creating their own content. I had my students create a a Wikispace page in our classroom um, in our classroom wiki <laughs> to uh, write reports on specific uh, on on animals because we were in science we were learning about living things and in in English we were learning how to um, write reports so we brought that together and the children created their content in the wiki spaces and and they offer they they would um, part of that was that they needed to check someone else's work and help them edit it with them so it was a way of them working together as well. Picked Chart is a great infographic creator. I've only used this with children uh, in year five and six because it does require a little bit of teaching and understanding of how Picture Chart works. It also needs quite a lot of different skills to be able to manage the spreadsheet aspects the, and and so on. So. It's a great tool for creating infographics, and those infographics can be related to any subject area that you're learning about. And what you end up with the end, at the end is a beautiful um, graphic that can be downloaded as a JPEG file, uh, and that can be shared with people. It can also be embedded in websites, etc. Oh yeah, <laughs> Kathy's putting in ex some excellent other options there as well. Um, brilliant. I'm going to be saving the chat from this session. <laughs> uh, Prezi uh, was mentioned before I think by Megan. Prezi is just great all round um, tool. You can make it as a presentation tool. Uh, you can use it to uh, explain processes. You can use it for all sorts of Different ideas, whether that be in English or or any curriculum area. Quite honestly, it's very very useful. Um, this one here is good old Garage Band. Uh, we had um, a few iPads in our classroom, so I uh, I would use sometimes set a task where students had to create a. A, a soundtrack for uh, a presentation or something else that they're doing, and they would do this in GarageBand. Now, though GarageBand itself isn't a visual, um, isn't a isn't isn't a visual tool, it was part of the process of creating a a digital text to share with the class. So it was an, an it was an expectation that they were using that as well. Um, ThingLink, like Kathy, it's one of my favourite tools, and I've used this not only to help children um, send them in the right direction for research, but I've also used it as an assessment tool for them to uh, for them to explain to me um, certain parts of their understandings. Um, Powtoon. I think it was Deanne who mentioned this in her presentation. Uh, my class loved this tool. They thought it was brilliant that they could put the people into to their presentation and make them do all different things. Um, 
I did allow them to play around with it a little bit before I made uh, asked them to produce a text for an assessment task because I knew that much excitement and and fun could be had with playing around and learning how to use it. So I often do that when I'm introducing a new new tool to my to my students. I give them a bit of time just to play around so that they can learn what to do. And often what happens in that learning is that uh, they come across problems that they might not be able to solve and they might ask the person next to them, do you know how to do this? And, and so it, it is actually having that time to play with those tools is really important because it's a problem solving process. So that when, does, when it does come for them to actually need to produce a text for a particular reason, um, it gives them the knowledge and the skills they need to be able to do that quite effectively. And if they do have difficulty at that time, they then have an idea of who they can go to to help uh, to get help from. Uh, Weebly, I tend to use Weebly for ed education. Um, if it's just education.weebly.com instead of Weebly.com because you can create, if you use the free account, which I always do, you can create um, a number of free student accounts and what you can then do with that is using those free student accounts allow students to um, create their own websites and that is always exciting when you can create your own beautiful looking website. It's really easy to use, it's a drop and drag function. I spent maybe five to ten minutes teaching a group of four, four children how to use it and then they became my experts in the classroom to help me out with other children using it. So it's a really great tool. The free version of it is excellent. You don't really need most of the, there's only a few extra features that you get by paying. Um, I think it's only a small amount of money anyway, I can't remember what it is now. But it is, the free version is just as good as the paid version. Google Docs, a favourite of everyone. I also I also use um, the Google Apps as well because Powtoon is actually one of the Google apps you can get that connects to your Google Drive. So within Google Drive you, you have a huge amount of apps that can connect to your drive and Google Docs, Sheets, Slides, forms, all of those are just a small amount of what you can do and students um, can very quickly become experts in using these tools in and, and producing the text that they need to, text, uh, to produce to for you. Uh, Slidely was a relatively recent find for me. I found it probably about 18 months ago and I really, really like it. So what Slidely is, is it's a tool where you can um, log on and, or not even log on, you, you just go into it and you can create um, slideshows using uh, pictures either from the web uh, and you should investigate it, it's great. <laughs> You can you can use um, so it can be slideshows from the web. I mean, sorry, not slideshows, pictures from the web, or it can be your own pictures. And what you do is you organise it, and you can then add a YouTube song to it, and it will play through, and it's quite beautiful. What I have used this for in particular, uh, I think it's I've never tried it as an app. I've always used it online, and so I'm not sure if it is an app. Oh, sorry, sorry to hear that. Um, I'm glad you made it. Yeah, it can be a bit tricky because one problem I had with um, some of the songs is I could play the songs through my account, but there must be some. It must only allow you to use in public the the songs or music that has been um, Creative Commons shared through YouTube. Um, so you just have to find a, a, a song that will allow you it to play in that situation. Um, but it's really great. I'm, I might have one in some of what I'm going to show you shortly, so we'll see. So how I used um, Slidely in my class is we were doing a unit on poetry 
poetry is always hard to teach, especially to, I had a year three, four class at that point. Um, so it's always hard to teach and I, I started by creating a couple of slide leaves about land, landscape, Australian landscapes and I just collected some image off, images off Google and selected some iconic Australian songs. So I think the first one I did was about um, the, the Red Centre. So I selected a song called My Island Home, which that one was sung by um, Christina Anu, and so that was just playing in the background. And what I asked the children to do while they were watching is record some of the imagery they, that they saw that stood out about Australia and the Red Centre, and we used those words and phrases to then create a poem about the Red Centre and it was just really powerful. The kids uh, actually asked to watch it again because some of them got so enthralled that they felt that they hadn't got enough information and they wanted to go through again. It was really powerful. It was one of the best um, poetry sessions I've ever taught and I'm sure I will never be able to do again. It was just brilliant. And finally, voice thread. Voice thread's really, really great. Um, it's a tool that allows you to put voice comments onto um, images and items like that. I haven't used VoiceThread um, probably for about eight or nine months, so or maybe it's 12 months now the last time I used it, but I always go back to it. I, I sort of go through these phases of using particular tools and then forgetting them and coming back. Um, Yes, Animoto is quite good. Um, I also find that Animoto is a little bit uh, uh, more visually nicer. I can't even put that in proper sentences at the moment. My words are not working properly. So yeah, I agree that there's, that's a good tool. Um, so what I am going to do now is I'm going to go out, well, actually before I go out to do a web, sh uh, uh, an app share, uh, um, are there any questions? Um, can Animoto be collaborative? And yes, yeah, I'm. Oh, there you go, Kathy's replied as well. Yes, it is collaborative. Uh, you can share it. Yeah, um, a lot of the tools are these days mostly collaborative. I think the people have latched onto that idea that it's important, especially if they're looking for an education market. Okay, so I'm going to go back out to the web and I'm going to go to my thing links. Okay, so what you can see here are some of the thing links I've created for my classroom. Now, these, um, some of them are my own images, some of them are images that I've collected from the internet. Um, for example, we'll look at the Bremen Town Musicians. This is one of my own images and it was part of a unit on traditional tales. This is a really hard statue to find. So um, as Cathy said in her session, it's the best thing about Bing Link is that you're able to choose an image either from the web or your own and then add um, links to it. So this link here that's coming up for you is a retelling, it's a link to a retelling of the story of the Bremen Town Musicians, the Grimm Brothers version. Then you've got this one here, it's a little video YouTube link. Over here um, is Rick Mayle telling the story and it's quite a, it's a very good retelling and that's why I put it there. I've always been a fan of Rick Mayle. Um, oh, and there's one there I missed too. And this um, link is actually some information about the the statue itself and the Grimm brothers. So it was a way for the children to put a bit of context to the story that we had read. Okay, now I might just bring up the chat so I can see that at the same time. Right, I'll close that one. 
Now the next one is still ThingLink. However, I set up my students with ThingLink accounts through the education. You can see here it's got ThingLink teacher. So I'm looking at this from my perspective as the teacher. You can set up student accounts. Uh, it's free. I didn't pay for this. Um, and for this particular purpose, this was a, a geography assessment. So the children had to um, do a number of different things and depending on what they were able to identify uh, helped determine their level of understanding. So these are year three, four children. So they had to be able to identify all the, ter uh, the names of the states and territories. So you can see here this child has um, got it right. <laughs> And down the bottom you've got um, some of the other ones, Victoria and little Tazzy down here. Uh, they were also asked to identify where they could the capital city. So that's Canberra, the Australian capital. Um, this child could identify Melbourne. She couldn't identify where Brisbane was, which should be up here. I think she's got Perth over here, yeah. Uh, then the next thing they were asked to do is, if they could, to identify some important um, features of our country. So this child has um, identified Sydney Harbour, almost in the right spot, it's not quite that far inland, but she has also um, generate, uh, found searched on through ThingLink to find an image of the Sydney Harbour Bridge to put there. And up here she's got the Great Barrier Reef. It wasn't a spelling test, by the way. <laughs> um, and, oh, she's got Brisbane a little bit too far up. Brisbane's down here somewhere. And then there was one other level that I don't think this student was able to get to. What they were also asked to do was, if they could, um, identify, um, write a couple of sentences about particular places that they had identified. So for example, if you were writing about, um, or here she's done this on, on Canberra, so she's called it the Australian Capital Territory Canberra, but she could have also written um, something like, um, it's our nation, national capital, it was built, it was established in 1920 or whatever it was, I can't remember the year now. Um, and she's also got that slightly in the wrong place. So at what myself and um, my teaching partner did once we had these was we went through and looked at them for accuracy. So for example, because this child's put Brisbane way too far up on the map, that would tell us that she still has a little bit to learn about the actual positioning of the, the, the capitals. But she has a pretty, she has a very good understanding of the names of the states and some of the, the important features of our country. And um, the children were always were are very excited to be able to share these sorts of things with their parents, so they can actually. Um, uh, most of them, we we uh, Google, we our uh, organisation uses. Google Apps for Education, so they were actually able to share these links with their parents if they had their parents' emails and they often did that because they were always excited about sharing. Okay, so um, yeah, it is a good uh, informal assessment but also really, um, Kathy, it's really good as a formal assessment as well, not the whole formal assessment but as part of that. I'm an advocate of using smaller assessments to um, to put together to, to, to demonstrate a whole because I find sometimes, I've found sometimes that it's really difficult for particularly elementary or primary age students to have um, to have a, the ability to remember all of those wonderful things you teach them along the way. So I often use smaller summative type assessments along the way that are then collected together as, as a, almost a portfolio of what they've learned. Um, so Anne has asked, does ThingLink have built-in capacity for images or does it provide images? Uh, you have a couple of op options there, Anne. Um, like I said, with my 
um, where am I? Me. Uh, I'll go back to mine now. You can upload your own images. Um, you can see. You can also upload your own video, uh, do video ones as well. So the Bremen Town Musicians was my image. The solar system is obviously not my image. I've just grabbed that from YouTube. Uh, and the Earth ones here are YouTube. And this one as well, I, I'm not YouTube, <laughs> Google. And this one here I actually grabbed from the ABC. And because I had a URL for it, I could put the URL in and it, um, it was one that could be used. So it allowed me to use it. Does that answer your question, Anne? Great. Um, okay, so that's thing link now. Oh, well, I don't know what I just signed up. Okay, I can close that. Um, I just wanted to share with you Weebly and how Weebly can be useful in producing digital text. Now, what you see here is some examples of how I've used this in my classroom, but I will show you an example of um, how my students have used Weebly as well. So I often build my learning inside Weebly just as Deanne does with her learning. Um, my students are obviously a little bit younger than hers. I've included some links to different places. This is the thing link I showed you before. So on this thing link, this is about my, well, my, it is my hometown, but it's also where I was working at the time. And we were learning about our local history. So you can see here an image of the main street um, from, I think it was about the 19, mid 1900s. Oh no, actually I think it was after the 1920s. This is, I think, the Anzac Parade. And you can see on the corner here, the actual building, that it's, it's the old Westpac Bank actually, uh, is still there. And so is the, the building here next to actually all of those buildings are still there. On the other side, however, a lot of them have had some issues. But what I've got here are links for the children to go to about um, our town and these were used for them to be able to study, uh, to, to, to investigate. I've also got here an embedded Google form that was a pre-assessment and a post-assessment of their knowledge about the area and it was interesting for them to compare the results because once they had completed both, I printed out the results and gave them their results and they were quite surprised that, oh wow, look, I actually, um, I actually learned something new. I'm just going to go to the top there quickly and show you an example of a student website. Okay, while well, that's loading, I'll come back. No more questions. Okay, so in our class, we also learned will learn about um, national parks. So I'll just scoot, oh, actually, is my slide leaf still here? Oh no, that will be in a different place. I'll look at that later. Um, now I'm just going to skip out to the student website that they created using Weebly. Now remember, these students are in year three and four, so they're about nine and 10 years old. Uh, and you can tell it's made by students because there are still some spelling errors, some grammar errors, some punctuation errors, uh, but that's okay. I, I wasn't too worried about that because part of their learning is that they went and looked back at this and they found most of the errors, but there are still a couple there. So they found all this information themselves. They inserted the pictures. The pictures, once again, came directly from Google because within Weebly you can search for images. You can also, um, if you've got the URL of the image, you can insert that or you can upload your own images. It's really a matter of um, how you want to do that. It was very simple for them to create. They met the expectations of the um, assignment quite easily. They did find some aspects quite difficult, however. There were some aspects of this assignment that were challenging because the information they could find um, was either non-existent or they found some of it a little bit difficult to understand. So we had a really good discussion as a class about um, what happens when you can't find the information you need. How can you, how can you get that information? 
Um, sometimes it's just not available, even on the big wide web out there, especially if you've chosen, like some of them did, rather small national parks there isn't a lot of information about. Um, so that generated some really good discussions. Um, from this, we also had a big discussion about, well, those people had their um, information out on the web, why can't we have ours? So, because a lot of the children did um, Google slide presentations, I embedded their Google slide presentations into um, a Google site so that the children could share these at home. And they were really excited because they then went home and proudly said, look, I'm on the internet, mum, I've, or dad, I've done a really good job of making this presentation. Um, some of the kids also made posters, so we had to take photos of the posters and put them on um, the website. So they could then share, look, look at what we've done. It really became a great um, way of children understanding um, that creating digital text can be even creating images to go online. So it's been a really great experience for them um, to do that. I'll just come back to the chat. I always forget about the chat. Uh, yes, mums and dads are very, very important in the whole process of learning and sometimes we do forget about them because I know uh, when, my, when my nephew was at school, I'd always say, oh, so when I saw him, oh, what did you do at school today? And it was like, oh, nothing. And it was the response from the age of about 6 to 18, oh, nothing. <laughs> So having the ability to, um, oh yes, and grandparent shambles, good point. Having the ability to share online um, some of their work was very, very appreciated. A couple of the children, now you bring up that point, shambles, um, a couple of the children were really eager to share with grandparents because some of their grandparents weren't nearby. Some of them were in... Sydney, which is a 10 hour drive away, some of them were in Perth, a couple of them overseas, so um, it became a really good way of them sharing um, their learning and I think that's an important part of creating digital, um, producing digital text for, for any curriculum because it then gives you an opportunity to share the learning with whoever, wherever. Um, now, I did want to show you, if I can, Slidely, because I can't remember where I've put the link for my Slidely. Uh, it would be under Poetry. These were the ones that I just created, so... Um, Oh, where did I put them? Oh. It's taking, here we go, it's taking a little while to load. Okay, I'll let that sit for a second while it comes up and I will um, I'll grab the link for you. So, can I just grab a quick smiley face if you can see that image? Um, shambles, what's up? <laughs> okay, are we still seeing the, are we seeing, um, hmm, is anyone else in the room seeing uh, some mountains and a sunset? Sunset? Yes. You can see a sunset. Good. Okay. So this one, uh, this slidely was about coastal Australia. You might not hear the sound, but I will play it. Um, it's just loading the video. It does take a little while because there's quite a lot of images in it. Um, so you'll just get a, an idea and, and if you can't hear the music, what you just have to imagine is there's a song playing in the background. So all of these images came from 
Google. Okay, I'll stop it there. You can obviously share it full screen, um, but you get the idea. It's basically just a, a slideshow um, for uh, um, it's basically just a slideshow for um, oh ah I've lost my sharing screen. Come back, there we are. Um, <laughs> slideshow with music. Um, now, if I can, I don't think the sharing thing comes up till the end. But anyway, you can have a look for yourself. You may have troubles with some networks blocking it because it does, uh, it is one of those sites that sometimes has a few problems. But if you've got nice people in your tech area, uh, it's really useful. And as I said, the children came up with some brilliant ideas for their poetry. Um, there must be some symbol or something missing there. Um, some really great ideas for their uh, learning uh, and their poems that we wrote together. Oh wow, time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> So that's just a small sample of some of the tools that I use in my classroom. I always really try to choose, particularly because I work with younger children, I always try and use tools that are simple to use, that are easy to teach. Um, and what that usually means to me, for me is that I, can, I, can, I know that I can teach you know, even the small group of kids and then they can teach others. I, I really make sure that what I'm doing is easy because I can then not only teach the children but other teachers how to use them fairly quickly and efficiently. Um, producing digital text has become so much more important in our curriculums around the world that we need to be able to do that easily and effectively. And what I make sure I do when I'm, I'm teaching um, children how to use these tools is that I do make sure that I don't try and teach too many tools at once because that can become um, a challenge in that they forget, oh, which one is this? Oh, how do I do this? My, my students by the end of the year, the first um, the year that I've had them, are very proficient at using Google Docs because we use it for a lot of things. And most of them are proficient at using a majority of the tools that I've introduced. And for some of them, I'll actually introduce more challenging tools to use, for example, like Picture Chart because um, they're ready for it and it's just about, and at times it's about allowing them to make choices because once students have a little toolbox of their own, Deanne was talking about our, um, toolbox, our toolbox before, once children have a little toolbox of their own, they then start making suggestions to you, well, is it okay if I use this tool to, to complete my assessment or to do this task? And that's where you know you've been successful as an educator, that they're coming up with some of the ideas themselves. Or when you're talking about, okay, we've got to do a task, what could we do? And they, they choose some ideas that are just perfect. You know, yes, I've won, they understand. <laughs> um, and, and for me, that's really important, empowering the students to know what they can use to, to produce the text, uh, produce text that they need to. Okay, I've got here um, a couple of resources for you. I'm just pasting them all into the chat as well. Um, you can often find my little um, social media tools um, around. I have quite a few web mixes. Uh, I'm still developing those, I'm still developing my Pinterest. I put a lot of my tools I find into the Scoop It page there. 
Um, I probably don't have quite as many as Shambles or Kathy. <laughs> I've got aspirations to be there one day. But um, these are tools that I tend to be selective about because I know that I'm going to use them in my classroom or with teachers to help them to use in their classrooms. Um, yeah, yeah, and I think that's really important and I know that um, Deanne did the same thing with her session. I think it's really important that people can see the, the actual application of these tools and how they can work and what the end result might be. Don't get me wrong, there have been disasters. There have been absolute disasters <laughs> and you sort of reflect on that and say, well, what did I do wrong there? And you figure out, um, you know, you figure out where you went wrong and you start again the next day or the day after. It's really important that we take those risks. We, we need to be risk takers as well as the students and I am an advocate of promoting that. Do something in the classroom, let it fail, let the students see that, oh, actually it doesn't work for her either or it doesn't, it doesn't happen how it's supposed to. It's okay if it doesn't work for me because I've seen some, some children get really distraught when, when they've been trying to, to complete a task and it's just not working because the technology's failing or something's not doing what it's supposed to. I, I am a, I like to take risks in my classroom to show students that it's okay to. Oh yes they can and I've seen it many times <laughs> and um, it's good to be, to be there to help out when you can. Okay, so that's my list of resources and I think next is just my um, contact details. So before I go to that, are there any questions that people have uh, about what I do and how I do it? Thanks, Anne. Uh, Deanne, that, that's great coming from you because you had some brilliant resources too. <laughs> Shambles? Yes, thanks very much for that. I, I, I love it. Um, the, the, just wanted to share a personal observation and then ask a question. What the personal observation is that uh, after all these years of looking at the tools, for me it's coming down to to basically one area, and that is weird storytellers and storytelling. And the tools that we're looking at, it's strange. Mm -hmm. My brain twists them into, oh, this is another way for us to tell stories. And digital storytelling for me and how to collaborate and share those stories is becoming central to my own sort of teaching and learning philosophy. But my question is to, to mm. Younes and the others that are in the room now, is that one tool that people aren't really talking about, which is a tool that nearly every child and teacher that I work with has in their pockets, is SMS, short message system. Whether it's, I think, WhatsApp is quite popular in, in Australia. In Asia, it's uh, Line is quite popular. In China, WeChat has taken over the whole population of China as an SMS system. Is anybody aware of or doing any sort of research or using SMS in their classrooms to support teaching and learning? And that's, that's what it was, Ness. Um. I personally, because I work with um, younger children, I haven't used it a whole lot. I have used it with teachers. I've used Poll Everywhere, is that I think was what it's called, with teachers um, in, their, in professional learning sessions that I run. Um, but I, obviously in my context, there are not a lot of the students, some of them do have their own mobile phone. Um, how, and it also depends on school policies around that because some, particularly primary schools, have very strict policies on how to um, a students being having those sorts of devices outside of learning. So I don't know if there are other schools doing that, but like I said, I've used some sometimes with um, with teachers. And I think because a lot of my students in my, I didn't even really consider it because a lot of them in my class did not have 
phones or or uh, iPads that they or not iPads iPods that they could bring to school. So um, yeah, I'm not sure if anyone else would think there's a bit of chat going on there about that. Um, so this and shambles we use yeah, apps. Um, it's probably my phone and the apps on my phone. But when students are doing something on a Chinese project, uh, if I put a message up and ask questions on WeChat, we almost get an instant reply. So I think one of the girls was looking for what kind of pets do they have in the rural areas of China. And because I could put the chat straight out on WeChat, we got two immediate replies sharing pictures of the pets that some had in rural areas and some had in the town, like like snails and you know the goldfish. And then that brought on a whole new conversation about why you know, they don't have the room, etc., etc. But I think that mobile and apps is going to really change the face of learning, perhaps especially with the secondary students. Yeah, I would agree to a certain extent um, with you on that. And I think there's changes happening within education and using those sorts of tools. Sometimes, um, though, what worries me, uh, Shambles, about new innovations like that is um, authorities, people in authority, I don't know, get scared. I know at a uh, previous school I worked at, uh, I, I asked if I could create a website and that was, oh no, you can't do that, we, we can't have our children putting things on the web and things and all of those sorts of things. Uh, however, at, at the, the next school I went to, it was, yes, please do that. That would be brilliant. Connect. You know, it's it's one of those things. Um, shambles, go for your life. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with the, with the comment about that policy restricts the teaching and learning process. But um, but I think I'm just looking at the names in the, in the room. Um, we, we, we're just pretty long in the tooth, some of us, as far as experience, well, I have to be careful what I say, as far as experience with, with technology in, in classrooms, and we've all seen it, haven't we? I bet we can all remember a time when schools would say, no, students will never have an email address. That's not necessary. And so I think it's a matter of just evolution evolving, and, and I think the question about SMS, we're, we're just ahead of the evolution of SMS being embraced by by the powers that be, and and using mobile, and how we use mobile phones or mobile devices, because it could be a tablet that would carry any of these SMSs as well, which makes it very exciting. But as was said in chat by somebody already, it can be really, really frustrating that you want to do this and 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 you're not allowed to. But for the kids, for the kids, most kids I talk to now, they say email. Sorry, email is old school. Uh, let's connect on SMS. Yeah, it, it is. It is. Um, I think the children are less worried about it than what teachers are. I guess, and that's why we're doing what we're doing. We're trying to share the love and see that it's not so scary and it's okay if you support the children in the right way and teach them the right way. You can get amazing results. Uh, anyway, we we get. We're running out of time, so I'll, I'll just flick through to my contact details. So these are my contact details. Um, I do have my Weebly site where I keep a lot of my resources all together. Uh, yes, lots of chances. And that's, Kathy, a point that I'm trying to make to a lot of teachers at the moment, that you need to give them the students opportunities to do that within your classroom, to allow them to do that safely and learn effectively while you're there to help them. Anyway, so I do have my, um, my Weebly site, my personal Weebly site. I do have a bit of a blog on there, but I've been a bit slack. I have a whole bunch of posts in draft, but just haven't finished them. <laughs> So I, I do hope to finish those off in, in the next little while and, and post them out to people. But I do keep all of my resources there and I've been developing some um, I've been developing some web quests and things like that just for fun. So um, thank you very much everyone. I'm very pleased to have, to be able to share my love of e-learning with you today. Um, and I really thank you all for coming. So if, if there's no more questions, um, I'll um, stop the recording and we can
Go on, no worries. Thank you. Oh, lots of sh lots of things coming in there from Kathy. Brilliant. Thanks, Kathy. Thanks, Shambles. Lovely, lovely to see you. It's a bright time of day in in Chiang Mai by the looks of it <laughs> to have you around. Um, Liz, okay, can I'll I stop the recording. Oh, yes, oh, I can say, can I interrupt you, Ness, and really thank you for this sure. wonderful presentation and the practical use of the tools in your classroom. I don't know how many mm -hmm. people know, but Ness is one of the um, coordinators of the conference, so she's had such a busy week already, um, been on duty moderating all morning and afternoon, so to be able to switch off and become you know, an accomplished presenter, uh, we thank you very much, Ness and for you know, sharing as much as you have with us. And I put a link in the chat a minute ago to the next session, which is with Jo Freitag on her persona dolls and gifted students. So we hope you'll join us in the next session. Thanks again, Liz. Great. Thanks, Anne. No problem. I really enjoyed it. <laughs>